Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be at the Flash Memory Summit today. My name is Karen Strauss and I'm a Senior Principal Research Manager at Microsoft Research. Today I'm going to talk about DNA data storage, that is storing digital data into synthetic DNA. This is a collaboration between Microsoft and University of Washington, and together we created MISL, the Molecular Information Systems Lab. And the goal is to study new developments in biology and chemistry and apply them to information technology industry problems. So let me talk about one such problem. Uh, what I'm showing here on the left is a chart by IDC that many of you are very familiar with. Um, showing the growth of the digital universe, meaning all the bits that we generate over time. And contrasting that with the installed capacity, meaning all bits that we can store in devices uh, over time. And what we're seeing is that there's a gap and it's a growing gap. Now, I'm not advocating that we store all the information we generate all the time. There's lots of temporary data, lots of data that we can discard, but the issue is that uh, we want to store a portion of the information and that portion if we simply follow this trend that portion is shrinking and that's what i'm showing here on the right so that can be a problem and to address a problem like this we may need quite different approaches um, to uh, putting a dent on and addressing these problems so let me um, use uh, this example here to contrast um, uh, the approach that we currently use uh, with a potential new approach to doing things. So currently, uh, the flash industry and really the semiconductor industry has been following Moore's law. That means essentially creating transistors, making them smaller, packing more devices into uh, more transistors into a device and making those devices more capable. Now, that's not the only way uh, to do things. So to contrast to that, uh, I, I'd like to bring up uh, something uh, that came up in one of Feynman's uh, famous lectures in the 50s, where he was talking about manipulating molecules. And if we have the ability to manipulate molecules, then we can arrange them in ways that could be used for computation and could be used for storage. And in fact, he used DNA as an example of information storage in nature. Now he stopped short of suggesting that DNA should be used for digital data storage, uh, but that, that actually came only a few years later when the, the structure of DNA started to be more uh, well understood. Okay, so what does it mean to store digital information in DNA? DNA is that double helix and each side of a double the double helix is composed of bases, A, T, C, and G. And if on one side of the double helix we have A, on the other side of the double helix we're going to have T. If on one side we have C, on the other side we're going to have G. So from an information storage uh, perspective, the two sides are redundant because if I know one side, I know what's going to be on the other side. Now let's focus on only one side of the double helix. Um, that is composed of sequences of these bases, A, T, C, and G. So if I want to store a sequence of bits in it, um, Essentially what I need is a mapping. And what I'm showing here on the right uh, is a mapping of uh, bits to bases. So every two bits um, map to a single base. And so if we, have, if we want to store a sequence of bits, all we have to do is to map those bits into sequences of bases, and then we can manufacture uh, bases, these sequences of bases. Today we have the technology to manufacture these molecules with arbitrary sequences. So obviously our encoding is more sophisticated than that, but this sort of illustrates um, this concept of mapping. Now we can make molecules of DNA, as I said, and what I wanna make clear is that the molecules we make are not biological DNA, they're synthetic DNA. So there's no life, no cells, no organisms involved in this type of digital data storage that I'm talking about. We're using DNA as a medium uh, to store information. But this is synthetic DNA. All right, so why? First, density. So what I'm showing here is a test tube. On the bottom of that test tube, there's a pink smear, and that is enough DNA. So that's DNA, it's dried DNA, and it's enough DNA to store 10 terabytes of information. So a whole hard drive can fit on that the tip of the test tube. 
And to put that in perspective, here's a data center. You know, data centers uh, today, you can store about the, the, an exabyte of data into uh, Walmart uh, size building. And uh, to contrast that with DNA, here I'm showing a picture of a data center. And what you'd need to store that equivalent is essentially that pixel there. You can probably barely see it, but there's a pixel there, I promise. And in real size, that's about one cubic inch. And so that's essentially one exabyte would fit on a palm of your hand. So that, that's really high density. Also, one of the properties of DNA is that uh, it may last uh, for a long time if kept under the right conditions. In fact, there's demonstrations there's of DNA that, that's actually quite old, uh, thousands of years or uh, hundreds of thousands of years that has preserved its information. So there's demonstration that under the right conditions, DNA will preserve its information. And in fact, uh, scientists at ETH Zurich, uh, who we, we work with, have shown um, that you can create the right conditions uh, synthetically so that the DNA can be encapsulated and uh, preserved its information for a long time. And in addition to it, uh, to that, because of its high density, it's also pretty, uh, pretty easy to keep the DNA around in these conditions, under these conditions. All right, so that begs the question, how does that compare to other types of media? So this is what I'm plotting here on the y-axis. I'm showing volumetric density. And uh, with different colors, the darker blue is showing where these technologies are today. Uh, the lighter blue is showing where we think they can get to. And then uh, the limit shows the maximum theoretical density for DNA specifically. Now, obviously, if we're going to build a system out of DNA, we need to uh, discount different types of overhead. But even after we discount those overheads, there's still a few orders of magnitude improvement in terms of density compared to comparing to the other technologies. Um, and also, lifetime of DNA is quite long, as I mentioned in the previous slide. All right. So another desirable property of DNA is um, that it doesn't go obsolete. Uh, and the reason is that now that we know how to read DNA, we'll always have, always have interest to, in reading DNA as a, as a, uh, because of its clinical applications, right? For the, the um, sort of health applications, life sciences, we'll always want to have readers of DNA. And so the technology uh, won't go obsolete. It's not like, um, floppy disks or, or uh, CDs that um, it's now hard to find readers for, for those, those media. Uh, with DNA, we'll always have readers. And in addition to that, the readers can improve over time uh, independent of the media. So we don't need to copy from uh, one medium to the next. The medium is DNA and uh, readers and writers can improve independently. Another property of DNA that we found out recently, and it was uh, quite a, a pleasant surprise, is uh, sustainability. So this, what I'm talking about here is environmental sustainability. And we compared uh, DNA to other types of uh, commercial media. So uh, here, specifically, I'm comparing to tape. Uh, we think DNA, the first uh, application of it, will be in archival storage. And so we're comparing to tape. And uh, we compared along three different dimensions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption, and water use. And what we're showing here is that uh, for you know, storing one terabyte of information for a year, uh, DNA uh, requires less of everything. And so it's more sustainable than, uh, than tape. All right, so let me walk you through a DNA data storage system. So as I mentioned in a, a, a few slides ago, uh, we start with bits and then we convert them into bases. That's the encoding process. And then we make the molecules and that's the right process. It's called also DNA synthesis. And that's what take us to the molecular domain. So until then we were in an electronic domain, essentially computer making the, that uh, encoding for us. But now we go into, with synthesis, we go into a molecular domain. We store those, uh, those molecules. And when it's time to read, we'll do random access, meaning selecting 
uh, molecules that contain the data we want to read. We'll sequence them. That's the read process uh, that converts that information back into the electronic domain. It's a noisy representation of the molecules, and then we use coding theory uh, to recover the bits. And this is not unlike what we do with hard drives, flash drives, etc. All right. So is it practical? Like how far have people gone with it? So we, we have been uh, able to store one gigabyte of information into uh, DNA. We try to pick from different types of media. Uh, like Project Gutenberg, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We stored high definition video from OKGo, OK which I would highly recommend. We stored databases. Uh, we stored uh, archival quality music in DNA. And, uh, you know, one gigabyte doesn't sound like a lot for, uh, for the storage industry, but it's a start. Flash uh, hit one gigabyte at some point in the past as well. And uh, it's actually been a big deal for the uh, biotechnology area, so much so that we ended up on the cover of Nature Biotechnology. And, you know, that has been growing. Uh, what we're, we're seeing here over time is essentially exponential growth on the amount of data we can store in DNA. And we, uh, we think that this will continue to happen. All right, so now I'm going to walk you through each of the steps in encoding and decoding data from DNA. First step is encoding. So uh, here I'm showing this uh, OKGO OK video. It's 44 megabytes of information. Now, we have now the ability to make sequences of DNA that are about 10 to 20 bytes. Uh, and so if we want to store 44 megabytes of information, what we need to do is to chop up uh, the data and identify it, the sequence. And so this is no different than mapping, you know, a big binary into multiple, uh, multiple floppy disks, right? You had to number those floppy disks. So essentially what we're doing is numbering the molecules, uh, right, that carry uh, the information and in the order that the information is organized in the original data. Um, in addition to that, we want to error correct, so we add some redundancy. And finally, we translate the bits into bases of DNA. We also add tags, and this is kind of a, a chemical a file identifier here. So once we have sequences that we want to store in DNA and store into molecules, the next step is DNA synthesis. So that's essentially manufacturing the molecules. And these molecules are manufactured essentially base by base. So um, uh, let's say here in this example, we start with an A, we, went to add, uh, we want to add a C. And so what happens is we flow in a fluid with all those Cs, a C attaches to that A, uh, and that C you see has a blocking group on top of it that that's little, that little hat on top of the C prevents other C's from attaching. So we can attach a single C there. The next step uh, strengthens the bond between A and C. And then uh, the next step, once we're ready to add the new base um, to that, um, to that uh, sequence of DNA, we'll de-block um, the C and allow new molecules to attach uh, to the sequence. So the sequence, the way to visualize it is, you know, the, the sequence of DNA is sort of like grass growing from the ground up, right? We're in base by base. Now, uh, obviously, we don't do one at a time, one sequence at a time. This actually, we, we can leverage massive parallelism to grow multiple sequences at a time. So what you're seeing here is what's called the array synthesis. It's a method to grow molecules in par parallel. And what you're seeing, different colors represent uh, different sequences of DNA. And in addition to that, we get some redundancy by having multiple copies of the same sequence grow uh, together. And this is an artifact of the way uh, the process works. So it's actually free redundancy. So once the molecules are made, uh, they're removed from the substrate where they were grown and encapsulated. Uh, and so uh, here is one example of encapsulation. So this is silicon nanoparticles. Uh, the DNA is, in, is uh, attached to 
uh, these particles and then another layer of silica is grown on top that protects the DNA uh, from the environment. And then you can organize the DNA into what we're calling here a DNA library, uh, which is very much um, sort of the analog in the DNA world to a, a tape library, right? Which is what I'm showing here on the bottom. So it's essentially a, um, a way to organize uh, different pools of molecules in a spatial manner so that uh, when you need to reference the data, uh, you can go back to that same location and uh, access the, recover the molecules uh, to read them. All right, so let's see how we read information from DNA. So what I'm showing here is an instrument um, that does a type of sequencing of DNA called sequencing by senses. And the idea is that if you remember that double helix that I was talking about earlier, we're essentially reconstituting the second side of the double helix and observing as it grows, as it's reconstituted, what we are seeing. And so just to illustrate that here is a, uh, we're trying to detect an A uh, and uh, we flow in um, a T that's attached to a green uh, fluorophore that's essentially a molecule that glows green when excited at the, the right frequency. And so because we can see the color green here, uh, we can tell that on the other side of the double helix, there's an A. And uh, using chemical tricks, we can remove that, uh, that fluorescent molecule and then continue growing the molecule uh, essentially base by base um, so that now this time we, we have a C and so the complementary base is a G and perhaps it's attached to a yellow fluorophore and so you, we can tell that this is a G being attached and therefore it mu there must be a C on the other side which is what we're reading. So it's all indirect, it uses lots of computer vision and what we get in the end is a bunch of noisy representations of the molecules and so I'm illustrating here errors uh, uh, with bold letters. And what's interesting about DNA is that the errors are not just substitutions, which is the equivalent of bit flips, but we also have base insertions where a base that we were not expecting there gets inserted, or deletions where a base is actually missing from the sequence. And this is not unlike networking and you know network uh, wireless transmission, for example. Okay, here's another way to read DNA. Uh, nanopores. Uh, so nanopore devices essentially have a bunch of these pores. They are nanoscale pores. The DNA is dragged through uh, via electrical force. And as the DNA goes through, uh, it causes disturbances in the current uh, through the device. And so by looking at these disturbances in the current, we can actually tell which of the four bases is passing by. So this device also generates, uh, you know, noisy representations of the molecules, and even noisier than the previous device, uh, because it's a it's a in, an emerging technology. It's uh, it's already commercial, but it's it's um, uh, it's noisier than the previous one. But it can offer other properties uh, that are more desirable, like for example, uh, reading in real time instead of a batch process. Okay, so we get a bunch of uh, noisy representations of the uh, the molecules we had and now we want to recover the exact bits that we stored uh, in the beginning. So the way we do that is through the decoding process as many of you know. So the first step is essentially to sort out the molecules uh, and group them in molecules that are likely to have come from the same place in the original file. Once that is sorted uh, we can uh, do majority voting in it for each of these groups to infer what's the likely sequence that was stored. Right. And then use uh, convert to bits and use regular error correction uh, techniques like Reed Solomon, which uh, this, again this um, uh, audience should be uh, pretty familiar with, to decode uh, and recover the original bits without any bit errors. So then once we have those bits, we can organize them again into the sequence um, where we, uh, with which we started and uh, recover the, uh, the file that we wanted to store. All right, so I just walk you, walked you through uh, this DNA data storage system. And our ambition as researchers is to develop this into something that, that looks like this. 
right, which we can place in our data centers and then wrap an archival service around and offer it to, to our customers. Now, if we can use, if we, uh, if or when we get to this point and we can uh, store information in DNA, the, it really begs the question, what else can we do with DNA? And it turns out, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but it turns out that there are certain kinds of computation that are well suited for uh, DNA. We use that property that I was talking about that A binds to T and T binds to G. Uh, in the following way. So let's say we have a database of images, which I'm showing here. We do feature extraction over those images just in the traditional way, extract those uh, features, and uh, but then use an additional step that maps these uh, feature vectors into sequences of DNA such that if the images are similar, meaning the feature vectors are not too distant, then uh, they map to sequences of DNA that are not too distant. So that if we want to query uh, within that database, we could, again, take another image, an image that presumably would not be in the database and find similar images. So we do the same thing. We do a feature extraction of that image. We create a sequence of DNA. Now we want these uh, sequences to bind, so we, we're going to uh, complement that. So wherever there was an A, we put a T. Wherever there was a C, we put a G. Um, so that when that sequence goes into the database, it will bind to similar images or similar items, right? Now, we also need a way to fish it out. So here, what I'm showing is a magnetic bead uh, that's attached to the DNA. We actually have the technology to attach a magnetic bead to DNA. And then when we place that into a database, um, so that, that molecule essentially goes into the database and binds to images that are similar to the query, then we can pull it out mechanically by using a magnet. Um, so those molecules are uh, pulled out and then re read out. And so we have items from the database that are similar to the query. When we started this project, the DNA synthesis and DNA sequencing were processes that were automated, but not much else was automated. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that whatever automation we would apply to it would be low cost. Um, so guided by we essentially built this prototype here. You know, it's, it's a contraption. It's really a prototype. It's not intended for large scale DNA data storage. But what we wanted to do was to learn and to demonstrate that it was possible to create a DNA data storage system uh, from scratch and that would fully automate the process. And this is what we, we did here. So what you're seeing here is a, a, a bunch of uh, bottles. That's the synthesis part. So that's the part that makes the DNA. And in fact, those four little bottles you see at the back in the back are uh, the four different phases. Naturally, there's other uh, reagents here that are necessary to make the DNA. Um, but the DNA is essentially made. It's stored. Um, sort of in the middle here, and then there's sequencing, uh, which is the reading process on the right-hand side, and what you're seeing there is one of the those nanopore devices that I talked about. So we essentially integrate everything. The goal was not large-scale DNA data storage. The goal was to show that automation is possible, and so we use this contraption to write the word hello into one sequence of DNA. Um, and we learned quite a lot from, uh, you know, building a fluidic system that can implement DNA data storage. In addition to that, uh, what you're seeing here is the uh, storage. And what, uh, what we're doing here is storing one sequence of DNA, but we wanted to be able to uh, manipulate more sequences of DNA. Uh, into a library. So that library that I showed you before, that's uh, not what that test tube is. Um, but wanted to implement a library. And so we replaced this piece with a piece that's called digital microfluidics that I wanted to talk about in this crowd because it's essentially built out of a PCB and a few other components. Um, so what this is, is a PCB with these pads that you're seeing there uh, on the left. And uh, you can essentially sandwich uh, droplets of fluids between that PCB and a sheet of glass, which is what you see at the top. And then you can control voltages between that sheet of glass and the different pads that you're seeing uh, to control via uh, something called electro wetting. You can control 
um, how these uh, droplets behave and you can change their shape and in the process move them around the board. So what I'm showing here in the middle is essentially a board in action. So that's real time uh, moving the droplet around. And uh, we can essentially use, in addition, we can use computer vision to track where the droplets are going so that we can uh, move them around and use them as primitives for the protocols required to automate manipulating the DNA, preparing it for reading, for example, uh, drawing it from the library itself, uh, for example, uh, so that uh, we can organize the DNA into a library, organize it spatially and recover it with this device. Um, so that's that. Um, so I just wanted to conclude by saying, you know, the future may include molecules. We may have in the future hybrid molecular electronic systems. I'm not saying that uh, molecular systems are going to completely uh, replace electronics. Each of them have their own place, and but they can be combined uh, to solve problems in the information uh, technology industry. So uh, I just want to conclude by uh, touching on these future systems. So just like today, we have CPUs that are accelerated by GPUs and FPGAs. Uh, the implication of what I was talking about in a previous slide is that we may use biomolecules as, as accelerators. We may also have a future with quantum computing and using um, you know, physics to solve some of our problems. And I'd like to point out that this is obviously not just my work. This is the result of hard work by a very talented group of researchers, very diverse all the way from computer science to coding theory, um, to computer architecture and systems, to mechanical and electrical engineering, uh, to molecular biology and biochemistry. Um, so great working with everyone, you know, it's been very productive. And if you're interested in getting in touch with us or reading more about our work, I have added pointers here to, uh, to this slide. Uh, so please feel free to explore. I thought I'd do a little bit of questions and answers. Uh, a question that I get very often is, is the throughput and cost of this technology already there for uh, data storage applications? And uh, it still has a ways to go. Um, it needs to improve, as you know, you know, with flash, it requires research, it requires even more engineering to get it to a point where it can be deployed at the large scale. It can be deployed at the small scale today, uh, but to get to the larger scale, it will require uh, some more research, a lot more engineering. This is normal for every uh, storage technology. But we asked this question ourselves when we started the, uh, the program as whether it can scale to these larger scales that I was talking about. And it turns out we looked at fundamental limits. We couldn't find any reason why it couldn't scale to that point. So we're very encouraged by that. And um, another question that's relevant to this cloud is to this crowd is um, do you expect it to replace flash? Um, and not anytime soon. Uh, flash uh, latency characteristics, um, you know, latency is, is quite a lot better. We're looking at DNA data storage at least as a first stop uh, into the archival storage area, so colder uh, storage. The technology to read the DNA is improving, and so latency uh, may get better, and we're, we might see it in, in warmer layers, but really the first stop is on archival storage. And uh, there's other applications that we're looking into. So for example, using DNA for mo as molecular tags. So for example, molecular QR code, um, uh, we've been studying that. Uh, we've been studying search as I pointed out in a previous slide. So there are other applications that, that seem quite interesting that are being explored right now. Um, I'd love to hear about uh, folks working on a more sustainable flash though. So if you have uh, any uh, developments that you'd like to share. I'd love to hear about them. Um, so make Flash, um, you know, as sustainable of a storage technology as DNA would be amazing. I'd love to hear from you on that. Finally, I'd like to conclude by saying, by making an announcement. We are creating uh, 
DNA Data Storage Alliance, uh, along with Illumina, Twist Biosciences, and Western Digital. And the goal of the alliance is to educate about the technology um, and also to look into use cases and develop use cases for the technology uh, to get to a roadmap of eventual uh, commercial deployment. So with that, if you're interested, uh, please uh, get in touch uh, and we'll follow up on that. So thank you so much for uh, watching the talk today and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.